this is Jeff. Welcome on in to a new episode of the Triart Academy podcast, where it's always better to get good rather than get wrecked. In this episode, we're going to be pulling back the curtain and exposing some secrets related to one of the most respected archetypes to date in the CDH game space. And much like the outbreak of the coronavirus, this episode is going to be one where you want to get a hospital mask for. Unfortunately, we're all out of hand sanitizer over here. So if you want to get down with the sickness, hop on aboard the Grand Princess with us and let's explore Curiosity Control. Oh, ah, ah, ah. Get up, come on, get down with the sickness. Get up, come on, get down with the sickness. Get up, come on, get down with the sickness. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of Curiosity Control, let's first redirect you to episode 12 where we talked about Niv Mizzet Pavern Control. In that deck, we utilized Curiosity Enchantments with niv Mizzet Payrun in order to set up a combo where we won with our commander. In this case, Curiosity Control does something very similar, although not to the same intended effect. Instead, we are placing our Curiosity style enchantments on a few select creatures to include one of our commanders in order to gain more hits than John Finkel's profile did in OK Cupid. <laughs> Now, formerly, this archetype used to be led by Rashmi Eternity's Crafter from Kaladesh. You might remember that block, along with Aether Revolt from such hilarious cards, such as Dramatic Reversal and Paradox in <laughs> Back then, Rashmi was used in order to slowly accrue card advantage just by the nature of casting spells on other people's turns. Then, a short time later, the hilarious D that's called C-16 came out and completely turned the archetype on its head by introducing the partner mechanic. Everyone say hi, Timna. Hi, hi Timna. Timna. From there, people realized it was better to just build your own Rashmi, rather than use Rashmi herself, and thus we come to the evolution of where the deck really took off. By placing a curiosity effect on a creature like Vile Smasher, we get to passively ping, draw cards, and revel in our own wealth like a failed Mike Bloomberg campaign. But wait! There's more! Vile Smasher, being quite the oppressive force that she is, generates massive amounts of card advantage with curiosity, just by imposing her will the same way the officials decided when it was a great idea to cancel the Comic-Con in Seattle this year. Alongside the ability to generate decent amounts of card advantage, we're going to be able to keep up mana for our opposition whenever they get the urge to do something. But of course, there will be times when our opponents won't want to do anything. Enter in Thrasios, Triton Hero, who gets to play the role of Dorothy in this Wizard of Oz epic by clicking her heels three times every time we activate him. Naturally, if Thrasios is Dorothy, then Vile Smasher is the arrogant wizard living in the Emerald City next to all of the other rich executives at Wizards of the Coke. <laughs> <laughs> As to the overall strategist deck, to best understand it, let's refer back to niv mizzet and Control. Notice how their strategies are similar. niv mizzet and Control and Curiosity Control want to land their pinger and a Curiosity Effect on their pinger, but that's where their similarities end. In context, let's compare their strategies by using an analogy. The analogy we'll be using here is by comparing two types of military issue small arms, the Remington ACR and the Remington Model 700. Now, both are small arms weapons, they're both rifles, and both put rounds down range. But that's where their similarities and practical applications end. The Remington ACR is an assault combat rifle, whereas the Remington 700 is a long range sniper rifle. One is used for close quarters combat, usually, and the other is used for sniping targets at long distances. Now that we have that basis covered, let's implement the bipod. In this case, our curiosity effect. If you install a bipod on an ACR and try to fire it, sure it will dissipate some of the recoil, but that doesn't mean it's going to be all that effective compared to pulling that same bipod on a different type of weapon. One is meant to use curiosity to kill the table right then and there, the other uses curiosity for incremental card advantage. In this instance, niv mizzet Payroom Control is analogous to the Remington 700. One shot, one kill. On the other hand, Curiosity Control is more akin to the Remington ACR. You're pelting your opponents, usually randomly, 
But in the end, you're bleeding your opponents dry. Now, pelting your opponents is passively all well and good. But what is the point of it all? Well, since the name of the game is Card Advantage, we will be squeezing cards out of the hands of our opponents by playing in a restrictive manner. Kind of like how real estate speculators jack up the cost of buying a house in Seattle. <laughs> uh, in fact, we're going to be pimping card advantage out of our opponents until we have more cards in our hand than cars on I-5 in Seattle during rush hour. Speaking of Seattle, just like trying to find a parking spot in the U District, Ugh. we're going to make it very uncomfortable for our opponents to maneuver in traffic. Yeah. <laughs> That's where curiosity and keen sense come in. They are vital in maintaining our own card advantage. But in order to maximize card advantage, there are two parts to consider when playing this archetype. The first involves bluffing interaction, whereas the other part involves what is sometimes referred to as the honest of interaction. Cole, why don't you go ahead and oh, describe Oh, most definitely. Bluffing. So bluffing interaction, when it comes to bluffing interaction, this part is fairly self-explanatory if you ever play any sort of control archetype in any format. In modern, for example, if you're playing blue-white control, you generally don't play on your turn. You play on your opponent's turn. Also, by holding up mana, you are signaling to your opponent that you have stack-based interaction at the ready in case your opponent does something to threaten you or your board state. But let's be fair, this is CDH, right? Right. Yeah. This is a multiplayer format, and that means priority goes through a clockwise rotational axis in turn order. It rotates and shifts constantly, depending on both where you are in turn order, as well as whose turn it is. And this is what brings us to our next topic, the honest of interaction, which is what I will talk about. The second part of succeeding with this archetype, and for really that matter, any Drago archetype in a multiplayer setting, setting is using the honest of interaction to your advantage. By this, we mean shifting the burden of responsibility related to interaction onto someone else, which is typically to the next person in turn order. Bear in mind that this is not limited to on-stack interaction. This applies to dealing with onboard problems as well, such as problematic stacks pieces. Needless to say, executing both effectively is crucial in order to progress your own board state, therefore allowing you to stay relevant in the game. Remember, even though that you are a reactive control deck, at your core, you are not responsible for answering everything that hits the field or hits the stack, even if it's a potentially game ending, unless you have a situation where you have no other choice but to answer it. Likewise, it's not possible to continually trade your one card for three other players without eventually running out of answers. You're going to run out of bullets eventually. This is why it's important to land an intermediate game objective in the early game, such as landing an early game card advantage engine or an early game mana engine in order to pull ahead on card advantage. Naturally, all of what has been said thus far translates directly into what your starting seven should look like. Now let's look at that now. When shooting for your starting seven, consider where you are in turn order, as well as who you're facing off against in your CDH pod. As do some hands are a bit more keepable than others. While there is no set in stone fast rule as to what keeps of hands you should keep, Keep on the lookout, though, for hands that might have the following. Two to three lands. One to two pieces of mana acceleration. One to two card or mana advantage engines. A relevant tutor. And some form of interaction, such as a counter spell, a board wipe, and so forth. If one of the cards in your starting hands is a cantrip, as opposed to a land, you may be inclined to keep it as well, as you'll be able to dig for more lands or other relevant cards as the board dictates. Decks like Curiosity and Control are fluid when it comes to their starting hand, partially because you are a reactive control deck. But there are two other factors to consider. Keeping or shipping a starting hand is 
also particularly contingent on what your pod composition looks like, as well as what your seat position is. The factors previously mentioned can take shape in numerous forms. If you're sitting at a table with a creature like Deck, for instance, such as Opus Thief or Kess Consultation, then depending on where you are in the turn order, keeping a hand with Mystic Remora and a blue source will probably pay dividends, especially if you're going before them. Likewise, if you expect to play in a creature light pod, then having a pyroclasm effect in hand is probably going to result in having a dead card in hand. Creature-centric decks involving Yisan, Timna, and Najila may also struggle a bit against you, as our board wipes are generally copies of Pyroclasm. Again, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but we can profit off of creature-centric decks meta-depending. By following the planned pathway of landing early game card advantage and mana advantage engines, you'll be able to set the table up for a no-win scenario. Here's what that scenario will look like. On the one hand, your opponent will eventually get bogged down by your multiple sources of advantage. This is something they don't want to have to deal with in the mid to late game, because you will eventually bury them in the end. Add any opponent who has been around the block and will know that will be coming into the match. On the other hand, they'll also need to save their interaction for bigger situations such as interacting with a game-winning scenario, or perhaps trying to execute their own game-winning combo, which means they generally won't be able to profitably interact with your advantage engines without giving up ground to your opponents. Once the no-win scenario is in place and the dominoes are stacked, it's time to move into the end game. This deck, at its core, is a mid-to-late game consultation deck, by definition, this means that we will be seeking to land the consultation combo in order to deck ourselves and win the game. For those who are not familiar, this combo involves the modular interaction of a consultation effect coupled with a lab man effect. For those wondering, the concept of a lab man effect may be, seem like a bit of a misnomer nowadays. This is due to Thassa's Oracle being introduced from Theros Beyond Death. As a result of that card, this archetype no longer needs Laboratory Maniac in order to win. This is because when Laboratory Maniac was used in this archetype, a cantrip was needed in order to draw from an empty library. Now, with Thassa's Oracle, there's no longer a need to worry if your demonic consultation or tame pack gets countered. You no longer are forced to go all in. While this archetype is fairly resilient, this style of play nonetheless comes with its own drawbacks, some of which can be mitigated, some of which cannot. We'll go down the line and list each issue as it arises. Stacks. Many stack stacks will run the Norod collection. Consisting of Norod, Stony Silence, and Collector Roof, many of these can be a problem, depending on when they hit the field. When coupled with a Blood Moon or a Magus of the Moon effect, However, this is where things can go really bad, as there are no basic lands in this deck when it's built to full power. Other stacks related issues can include, but are not limited to, Static Orb, Price of Glory, Defense Grid, City of Solitude, and Non-Creature Spell Hate. Mana Base Sensitivity We just briefly touched on this deck's non-basic lands, but we'll cover that a bit more here. We run a true singleton land base in order to accommodate Tainted Pact, and due to your non-basic mana base, your land base is fairly sensitive to stacks. Needless to say, stacks effects that neuter your lands, such as Stasis, Back to Basics, Blood Moon, and Root Maze, when coupled with other stack pieces, will cripple you eventually. Mass land destruction, while not that commonly occurring, can also cause you problems in the long run as well, as this deck can have a very hard time recovering post-MLD. Draw and Tutor Hate While we're on the topic of stacks, let's touch on Draw and Tutor Hate. 
On average, you can expect to draw an extra one to three cards per turn cycle when all cylinders are firing. While this may not seem like much, the accrual of these extra cards are necessary, as they will add up over time. However, though, cards like Stranglehold and Notion Thief can be a problem if they hit the board under an opponent's control, as they will stifle your own ability to progress your own game plan. RNG Dependency This deck is somewhat top deck dependent. With the exception of the few tutors it uses to secure the board, this is because your underlying hope is that your overall card advantage will outweigh the situationally bad cards you'll inevitably draw in a given situation. Depending on how you build your own version of this deck, ask anyone who's played Magic for a while and they'll tell you, RNG is a thing, and it's a thing you cannot avoid. Speaking of RNGs, let's move on to Demonic Consultation and Tainted Pact. While we've already touched on Tainted Pact regarding our land base, we haven't explicitly touched on playing Demonic Consultation. Playing Demonic Consultation comes with a risk, and that risk involves the cumulative chance of failure. This is something we've touched on previously in our video 3 Card Monty, which was on Kess Grix's consultation, but it bears repeating. As the size of your deck decreases, the chances of hitting the card that you named with Demonic Consultation in the top 6 cards, while using it as a tutor, increases. Bear this in mind as the deck has no way of getting cards out of exile. Finally, on the topic of exile cards, if for any reason both of your lab men are exiled, you're done for. This will very rarely happen, if ever, but it bears mentioning. The Veil of Illusion and Secrecy. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You are Grateful creatures, think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. By nature, this deck is fairly reactive to the board state, which means that you'll have to employ bluffing and burden when it comes to interaction. More explicitly, 4C Rashmi relies on the Veil of Illusion along with the Burden of Interaction in order to maintain control of the board. What that means to you is that you're susceptible to a telepathy effect. If either telepathy or revelation resolve, you are screwed until you can get them off the table. Pyroclasm Problems Creatures with a toughness of 3 or greater will survive many of your pyroclasm-oriented board wipes. Thankfully, there aren't too many creatures that have a toughness of 3 or greater that see CDH play, but there are a few out there. Be on the lookout for them. Low Creature Count Speaking of Pyroclasm, this archetype generally has a low creature count, which can result in combat-oriented decks profiting off you. Chief among them are Timna decks and Najila decks. Thankfully, you do have some instant speed uh, pyroclasm spells to deal with this issue, but not as many as you think. Be careful, as you could get run over by them. This deck is extremely effective in the hands of somebody who is not only familiar with their meta on a whole, but who is also familiar with the playstyles of their opponents. Overall knowledge of your meta, as well as deck knowledge of your opponents, is extremely helpful in succeeding with this deck. This is because that info will help you with not only reading in-game situations, but it will also help you in being able to actually forecast how your opponents will most likely act over the course of a couple turns at any point in the game. Credit and thanks are in order to Siggy of the Laboratory Maniacs as well as Sick Robot, who are chief among the Archetypes designers. We will be posting their master list along with our version of the list, in the description section of this video. Additionally, for those of you who are interested in trying this archetype on a budget, we will also be posting a budget variation of this archetype alongside the other two lists in the description below.
Now, that's all the time that we have for this episode of the TriArt Academy podcast. If you like this episode and want to see more content like this, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, it's always better to get good rather than get wrecked.